You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group. And co-hosts, Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody, that rocking tune means it is time to rock out once again, kicking off our broadcast week here on the old Options Insider Radio Network with, of course, your favorite, everyone's favorite, my favorite, your favorite, everyone's favorite, all the shows I can't choose. They're all like my children, but everyone likes this one as well. This, of course, the Option Block coming at you live, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. Get those questions, those comments in if you haven't already. A lot of you have already been chiming in. I think we're going to devote a substantial portion of the show today to what you guys have on the brain, which, spoiler alert, is many interesting things. <laughs> we'll get to all those in a little bit, of course, wherever you listen. And on out there, leave a comment if you are so inclined. Help other people continue to discover the more important now than ever in this period of market madness. Folks have a, a sane place to turn a repository of good information in these Fake news times, so help others. If you like what you're hearing, help others continue to discover the network. Of course, my name is Mark Longo from the aforementioned network as well as, of course, from theoptionsinsider.com. And let's see who we've got joining me on this once again into the mouth of madness episode of the Option Blog. It sounds like you've heard this dance before. Yeah, you kind of have. But we've got to do it yet again nonetheless. And joining me on the old all-star panel today, let's see who we got first We've got, let's see, let's go out to a sleepy, a quiet Hamlet, where we are joined, once again, I do believe, by the uncleist of Mike's, Mr. Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Advice. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program, sir. Never before in the history, wonder where I'm going with this, of the last 15 months, has there ever been a better time to buy than today? <laughs> I was a little, I was a little confused as where you were going with that, but uh, I'm okay. I'm down with it. I like it. I like it. Flipping the script. Now there might be a few better times to buy coming up in the next day or two, which we'll discuss on this show. But uh, trying to keep it interesting today, as if it's not interesting enough already. Yeah, you know, I like it. Flipping the script. That might also be the fastest you've gone from saying there's never been a better time to sell than never been a better time to buy in the history of the show, which would be pretty much in keeping with the record pace of the downside we're seeing in the markets. And also joining us from who knows where he is. It could be from the Option Pit slash Carmen Line World Headquarters. He could be from it can't be from his kid's school because all of our kids are, are off school these days, which is joyous. And or it could be from a Costco near you. He could be raiding the TP as we speak. He's the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian. Mr. Meatball, put down that TP. How are things uh, going in your neck of the woods, sir? Oh, it's just a joyous day here at Option Pit. We're uh, we're having ourselves a, a day of it. You know, um, markets are. Uh, let's just say markets are moving at a clip. Uh, I am. Uh, 
I'm a big fan of what I'm seeing here. And uh, there's not a lot to, uh, I mean, who could be happier than, than to, be, uh, to be trading on a day when the VIX is, you know, we'll see. It might break. I, I would be less than surprised if we don't see peak volatility. Peak volatility, folks. Uh, and so that, that is what I'm, uh, I'm kind of watching today is are we going to get peak volatility? And the Interesting. Is, You're putting the top in for vol here. Interesting. I, I don't know if I'm putting the top in, but yeah, I guess that sounds kind of like I'm putting the top in, doesn't it? So if you're saying peak volatility, you're kind of putting the top in. So you're going to draw a line in the sand this far, no further to the upside. Interesting. Will we hit peak volatility? Maybe perhaps in this episode. We shall see. And also joining us, I thought it was an appropriate time because uh, there's so much going on. There's the flow. The flow is overwhelming. There's madness out there in the world of options. So we thought, who better to help us parse this madness than the flow master himself, Mr. Henry Schwartz, the founder and CEO over there at Trade Alert and indeed What's Trading. Mr. Flowmaster, welcome back to the option block, sir. It has been too long. Hi, guys. I am happy to be back. And uh, it certainly is an interesting time to be involved in the markets. Uh, Mark, I want to know if peak volatility is, is – is that like peak foliage in the fall? It, yeah, it's like it's – like right now for volatility, it's like, uh, you know, call it uh, late September in Michigan or in uh, New Hampshire. Late September, early October. It's like – it's that one week a year where everything is gorgeous. I, I got you. Well, I'd be pretty happy if, if this is the peak and things smooth out a little bit. I, I got I to say, Henry um, – and and I know you'll believe this. I was they were letting me put on downside March spreads in SPY for even money and credit today because of how screwy things are. Um, I laked into all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff that I can't believe I was able to do because uh, markets are closed. I mean, one of the advantages. I mean, I hate to say this, but things that I don't think would be there if the SIBO floor was open are these March spy put spreads that I'm putting on for for credits. And even with uh, even with the exchange fees, I'm getting out, you know, some of these exchanges I've been able to arb out of, out of the exchanges based on where they are. So these are one to one spreads or you're legging into one to one. One, one to one, one spreads uh, for even money and credits. I bought the one so I bought the March one hundred sixty five put spread for nothing. I bought the March one thirty five, one thirty three put spread for Nothing. And, uh, you know, you don't expect to be able to do that type of stuff. And um, it was, uh, you know, of course, the joke is I paid nothing for something that is worth nothing. Um, But, you know, the, the, the thing here, folks, is I'm not planning on these being in the money. What I'm planning on is that the market gets worried enough or terrified enough that I'm able to sell this thing at a nickel or a dime or, or, or got, heaven forbid, a quarter. And now something that I got for free is worth real dollars. And you just don't get those type of opportunities. No, you do not. So without further ado, let's break them all down as we head on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody. Welcome to the trading block, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading. And if you couldn't pick it up there from the top of the show, we're in a little bit of a uh, repeat holding pattern here. You may have heard this episode before. Go back a week or so ago. Yeah, we opened up on the weekend after some crazy news. The literal weekend risk that is being priced into these markets these days is just off the charts, and it's it's worthy because every weekend something crazier happens of course uh, last week we had all the madness that led into opening straight off the price war in Saudi Arabia other things that led us to opening pretty much and halting immediately on the open similar playbook this week uh, we had the Fed coming in on the heels of emergency action last week coming in and we joked about them emptying the chamber before quite literally emptying the chamber this weekend rates are now at zero effectively here in the U.S. So the Fed put in the quantitative easing last week. They did the emergency cut a couple of weeks ago, and now they cut all the way to the bone on a weekend, too, which is interesting logic. And in that you think you might want to get some of that lift 
in uh, the trading session, but I guess they were worried about opening limit down, which is effectively what we did anyway. So the Fed put is in, and the Fed put is apparently meaningless because this is about the third strike I think we've blown through now on that downside. The market just doesn't care. They say, thanks for those, thanks for those bullets. We'll take them, and we're just going to eat them right up and keep marching right down. So the Fed put has been overwhelmed. The Fed put is moot. We are halting yet again on the open. Coming into the show now, we're seeing most of the major indices still well off. They were off 8%. Now they're off only, S&P only off 7.5%. So I suppose there's something to be said for that. We're bouncing off the lows a little bit. Dow threatening right around right around 8%, a little bit shy of that. And the NASDAQ off about 7 three quarters percent So there's a ray of hope out there. <laughs> we're not off north of 8% yet again right now. And, of course, uh, everything out there has spun into madness. Our old friend VIX Cash, uh, it's up yet another over 12 handles since our last, about 13.6 or so. It's about 78, 70, almost 79. And so that's up about over 13 handles from our last show. Just when we thought we couldn't go any higher, and if you listen to some of our Vol Views predictions, they were along those lines. I guess we have a whole week for that to play out. But still, VIX Cash feeling the juice. Our old friend VVIX, a.k.a. the volatility of volatility, up. <laughs> Get ready for this. 38 handles. From last show, as at about a 192, we still at about a 192 right now. Actually, a little bit less than that now. Just come off now, 188 and a half. It's about 30, 36 handles <laughs> out there. And our old friend, Mr. Dave Lincoln, has been on the ball show in the past. Uh, he's chiming in this morning. He thinks VVIX is up because a lot of substantial put buying out there in uh, in the VIX land. In particular, looks like it was the uh, 45s, 845s. Uh, getting gobbled up for size, and he's he's pinning a lot of the upside in VVIX on that, which does make a wee bit of sense. And, of course, Mark kind of alluded to at the top of the show, we're all living right now, in addition to the sell-offs and everything else, from an options perspective, from a purely options perspective, we're all living in somewhat unprecedented times. You know, Ever since the, the rise of the ISC, back when I was first walking onto the floor of the SIBO there in the late 90s, uh, everyone has talked about this all-electronic future. Well, for the most part, we pretty much have that now for the first time ever in the options market. The SIBO closed their trading floor as of end, of end of business day Friday. CME closed theirs last week for the futures option side of the fence. Now we're hearing uh, NASDAQ following suit with the Philly. I do believe, I think uh, the NYSE stuff, so Amex and Picos, I do believe they are still open. But I'll have to check and make sure for those. But if they're not, then effectively we are 100%. Uh, electronic on that point. That means, of course, products like SPX, which are predominantly pit traded, now all electronics. VIX, big pit presence, now electronic. As Mark was alluding to, we're getting some weird prints <laughs> with some weird markets out there as a result. That could also be exacerbating some of the issues to the downside, which is why maybe liquidity not that big. But you know who's a good person to have on to help parse stuff like that? It's the Flowmaster. Mr. Flowmaster, We'll start with you as our guest. Welcome on in these unprecedented times, this pretty much all electronic options market we're dealing with. Uh, you've obviously been watching a ton of flow. I've been watching your various accounts, you know, at Option Alert on the Twitters and LinkedIn everywhere else. You kind of almost been daily tweeting out new volume records across the board. So it's, it's kind of almost an impossible task for me to ask you to sum it all up. But let's do that. Let's sum it all up. What's been really blowing your doors off over the past couple of weeks from a, from a flow and volume perspective, sir? Well, you're right. I mean, I th- I'm afraid I'm going to get kicked off of LinkedIn because I keep just making these new posts like, there's another volume record. Oh, look, there's another volume record. Uh, it's been so insanely busy in the last three weeks uh, that it, it's, it's re- it's really is unprecedented. Uh, you know, I went back to, to, you know, even back as far as 2008 and, you know, because really now that's what all the comparisons are against. And, you know, we're just, it's just insane. You know, I mean, we're, we're like 51 million individual trades over the last three weeks. It's about double normal. Uh, I just, for, for Reuters, I just ran notional open interest that's set to expire this, this Friday, the 20th. It's $2.4 trillion worth of notional option value. And we're not even, we have a whole week for that to continue to build up. So, uh, that's not yet a record, but it's close. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the focus is on uh, is on VIX. Uh, and it's funny, about a few months ago, we came out with some functionality and option art that, that lets people go back to any date that they want back about 13 years. 
And so I would demonstrate that by saying, hey, look, you can go to VIX in November 20th of 2008. And I would ask these traders, usually kind of young people, because I'm old and the new crop is, is in their 20s. And I'd say, well, you know, where do you think we close? Where do you think VIX closed in 20, you know, November of 08? And these these people, they look at me, they're like, oh, that was the crisis, you know, maybe like 50. And, you know, that is the over 80 highest close on record. Yeah. Yeah. And I, one kid, and I will call him a kid, he looks at me, he says, he goes, wow, I was in middle school then. <laughs> and I was just like, all right, well, I already felt old. That's the guy you want managing. That's the guy you want managing size money right now is uh, the guy who was in middle school in 2008. <laughs> it, it, exactly. I mean, and he's he's a bit he's a big shot trader at a bank. And, you know, we're into uncharted territory for I would guess most of the traders out there. Uh, you know, have never been through this. And, you know, every single time we get a big, big move, we go, you know, this feels a little different this time. And you got to say it on this one. I mean, not, you know, you, you, not only is there fear, but, you know, besides fear of losing, you know, the next 25% of your portfolio, people are personally scared about what their life is going to be like for the next three Couple months. Weeks, six yeah. Months. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm in New York City and, you know, we're sticking around, but I know a lot of people that said, I don't want to be in the city if they start closing down all the businesses and, you know, we don't know if the trains are going to run. And, you know, people are freaking out. I mean, that's safe to say. Uh, you know, it, I'm impressed by the way the market has held up. Mark, Sebastian, I know that, you know, I've seen some of these um, spreads invert and condors uh, tradable for credit. And if yeah. your brokerage platform is able to keep up with the traffic, there there is some amazing opportunity out there. Um, but then you know you see things like you know situations like Robinhood, where the platforms freeze up because this is this data why, levels are so high. That's why there's you know people wonder why they should pay brokerage so that your company is willing to invest in the pro its pro own products. You know that's really the key, and. Um, you know, that, that's what it comes down to. And so I am not, you know, I've never been the type of guy that expected anything free. And yeah, you know what, I, Henry, I, I, what I've kind of joked about is that this, this does not feel like 2008 at all. Um, but it doesn't feel like anything we've had before either. You know, I liken it to like if 2008 and 2015 had a baby, maybe this would be it. Because it's faster than 2015, but maybe not doesn't feel quite. A, I know, I know people are kind of physically scared about their future, but you know, I, I don't know. Like, I don't feel like even by this time in like August or September of 2008, you were worried that banks were going to start failing and that the the financial system was going to collapse. This doesn't feel like the financial system is going to collapse. But what it does feel like is that the economy is going to have a serious recession for a short for a short period of time, and markets have never have not dealt with a real recession in 12, 13, 14 years. And we have a bunch of people who, like you said, were in middle school the last time we had a real recession, so they don't exactly know how to price anything. And so, what I and this is why I think we could see a, a new we could see a higher volatility. And we can see markets move faster, but I think we do come out of it a little quicker. You know, 2008, we didn't hit a new, you know, we, so think about it this way, right? The way to measure a real bad market is, right? We had our, prior to 08, what was the all-time high? It was sometime in, in 2007, right, Henry? Or was it 06? Mark, I, mute yourself. Um, I think it was 07, yeah. Yeah, so we had that high in 2007. And when... We uh, and so and then we didn't see another high until what 2013 2014. Does that sound right? Another new high. When did we break the the, the pre pre 08 high? It had to be 08 uh, 14 or, or maybe 13 or 14, right? Yeah, and, sounds, sounds right. So we are not going to see it take six years for us to get to a new all time high. So I, I think we could see back above 3000 by year end, you know, by whenever, because I don't think this is a permanent financial system shock in the way that 08 was in that, like, you're not seeing everything fall apart. Um, 
you're not seeing everything fall apart the way you are in uh, 2000 and we did in 2008, but it definitely is not like anything people who have been trading, but uh, it's not anything that we haven't seen. Uh, you know, we've seen since 2008. So this is not going to be like the world is ending like it was in 2008, but this is going to be harder, faster and stronger than anything you've, you've seen. If you have not been trading in the, in the since for, if you traded anything post the last decade, that would be what I would say. I don't know. So tell me if I'm telling, talk to me if I'm telling tales outside of school. You're telling tons of, uh, of tales, sir. But, you know, it's interesting. And you're right. You know, the, the notion that we could jump back. I don't know. These, these shocks we're seeing in the system are, are fairly unprecedented. I mean, not similar. They're not as systemic. You're right. They're exogenous shocks. And we discussed that on the show last time with Goldman doing their analysis of, of various bear markets, systemic, cyclical, and, of course, uh, exogenous, event-driven like this one is. And the extent of this event, we don't really know yet. You know, that we're seeing all sorts of ripple effects, you know, small businesses, restaurants, and all the people they employ are pretty much uh, being uh, shut down for the time being. Schools shut down, so that's overwhelming health care. People have to go watch their kids. So a lot of interesting things that are, you know, maybe unanticipated consequences of these that we haven't really seen before. And so processing all of that, pricing all of that in is, is a challenge right now. So, you know, when times are challenging, we turn to the level head, the sane head, the quiet head. The ever pessimist, I should say ever bullish, ever optimistic head that is Uncle Mike. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, we're in the land here, uncharted territory. Not quite Uncle, Mark, Uncle Mike markets here, but what is, uh, what is on your radar as we, we replay this movie from last week, sir? Well, I, I mean, I think you really need to come back to uh, what we talk about constantly on our show, and that's risk management. And if you're managing risk, you're going to survive this as a short-term trader. Meaning, um, you know, I said it before. I'm pretty. I'm ninety. I've been ninety-nine percent cash since we went negative on the year, and that's a rule. Uh, did I want to do it? No, I never want to be in cash. I want to be in the game trading like everybody else. But for aggressive short-term trading, I I managed risk, and that's how I'm going to survive this. Um, now, in terms of if you're a buy and hold person, I'm really believe that in the next 10 years that this market is going to be higher than it was a month ago when we were at our all-time high. So it might take us 10 years, who knows, but I really do believe that. And if you're in a buy and hold uh, style of position, then although it's going to be painful for you right now, it's one to where you're likely going to be okay if you're in a decent long-term stock holding or a, um, an index fund or whatever the case may be. Um, so I think that in a market like this right now, uh, the only real opportunities that I'm looking for are things like what uh, Sebastian described earlier. Um, if you find something like that, great, take it. Um, but in reality, I think that um, you know, the main thing that we need to do here at this stage is that um, – if you do want to do something on a more buy and hold level, then it might not be a bad time to sell some puts to get into something. Uh, I had a client with some cash on the sidelines uh, uh, last week when we spoke, and uh, she's like, well, what can we do at this point? And I'm like, well, SPY is at 250. Um, would you mind buying SPY if it dropped another 10%? And she said, no. So we went out eight days and uh, we sold uh, uh, a uh, just a short put on SPY for um, a pretty decent amount for those one week out. And so on that, uh, she's more than happy to own the market at that level. I mean, it wasn't a discretionary trade of mine. She just had some extra cash on the sidelines, and we were just kind of talking about it. But she said that she'd be fine riding it out uh, if she did get it put to her. And so I think there's opportunities like that. I think that if uh, you look at this market and you're okay holding stock for the long term, this can be a phenomenal opportunity to just buy in or just simply sell puts to get in if you're not getting the price you want right now. Uh, so with it, I, I think that uh, the other interesting thing on this is that everything's going down except for treasuries and that corporate bonds are going down. Uh, my beloved silver is going down. Um, and everything is packing into the treasuries. So, I mean, at some point this is going to come back. There's very, there's no 
Okay. So I guess just to finish my point here, I, I think that if you're looking to do short-term trades, you got to be very careful in something like this because uh, you're going to get chopped out pretty quick if this goes against you. Even if you're bearish in an environment like this, remember, we had a monstrous move to the upside on Friday. Um, our president even signed his autograph to a daily chart of the big Dow move. Um, I wonder if he's signing his name to the to the move today. Probably in the now. Yeah. So, and, but, and Mike, to your point, sure, that, you know, got to be careful. I think that there are a lot of people who are sitting on the sidelines in cash that are terrified of the market. You know, if if you're not thinking about starting to employ some dollars here, when are you going to employ them? Right? I mean, are you going to do? You, uh, are you just going to sit in cash and, and be terrified the rest of your life? Um, you know, uh, uh, many of you know, Mike has, um, accounts for my children and I am, my wife and I were talking today about sending him some checks, uh, to, uh, in, uh, buy some stuff for my, uh, my kiddos. So there, uh, you know, so there you have it folks. I, 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 uh, I, I could say, yeah, if you have a long term outlook, two years, five years, 10 years, um, this is the time you should be licking your chops. If you have a short-term outlook, that's why you come to someone like me. You have a long, long, long-term outlook. Uh, then uh, you know Mike. Mike's the man. And if you want to know what the outlook is, what's who's trading the outlook? Well, then that's when you go see Henry Schwartz. <laughs> and to see all of us, you go to the, you go to Mark Longo. There we there go. You go. Or listen to like us at the very love, least. Love fest here, folks. Not a, not a lot of watching, but a lot of a lot of looking or listening, I should say here on the show speaking of mr schwartz since he's on let's do an all all trade alert themed uh, rundown of what's lighting it up out there in the marketplace right now let's kick it off with the major indices and let's get you guys can find this for yourselves tradealert.com or head on over to watch trading if you like the more retail sized slice of the pie vix as we said we've seen this movie before so that probably explains why we're not seeing the orders of magnitude of paper you perhaps might expect if we just woke up for the first time out of the blue and the markets were limit down and circuit breakers were triggered and all hell was breaking loose out there. We've done this dance before, which explains why there's only 733,000 contracts on the tape in Vixland as of right now. But the ADV ticking up there, as we said before, getting up there as we continue to see just plus million contract days Almost every day out there of late in Vixland, the ADB right now about one, almost one and a quarter million out there. So a far cry, about 4x from where it was just a few months ago out there. Spy topping the 4 million contract level, 4.12 million, the ADB 5.7 million. Keep an eye on Spy out there today because Spy is kind of, in terms of electronic S&P liquidity, and just S&P liquidity in general, if the S can't keep up or is not able to move as much paper as it usually does from an options perspective, Spy might have to pick up the slack. It'll be interesting to see. Spy already doing a lot of paper, 4.12 million. Maybe that's some of that is folks migrating over from the S who traditionally trade in the pit in the S and maybe are deciding to dip their toes into some size Spy waters. Obviously, either way, Spy doing a lot of paper. Uh, the S at 1.1 million, which is impressive given the fact that the pit is shut down for the first time ever. Zebo Systems. Holding up, at least for right now, ADV about 2.1, almost 2.2 million out there. So roughly half the ADV already up. And so far, at least I haven't heard anything about outages on SIBO, but so far at least, appears to be holding up. The Qs at about almost 500K, 493,000 contracts out there. The ADV out there in Qs land is, oh, about one, almost 1.2 million contracts and rounding out our indexes out there the russell which if you've been paying attention to twifo of late you know the russell's been leading the dance to the downside so everyone out there is thinking oh small caps kind of insulated from these systemic shocks not so much these days every week we've been pretty much the last three weeks we've seen russell 2000 leading the dance the only thing that's even close is the s&p 400 the mid cap uh, which is somewhat interesting. So, yeah, Russell 2000 has been leading the dance. Volume-wise, not so much today. The IWM only doing about 280,000 contracts. The ADB a little bit shy of 600K, about 584,000. Let's move on out to the most actives as well. Again, let's fire this off off of the, the trade alert platform here. Number 10, Uber. Interesting. Maybe as a result of every restaurant being shut down, Uber can come in and 
deliver, keep some of those restaurants open. Folks maybe using more Uber. Maybe Uber's taking it on the chin, a little bit of combo. Who knows? Either way, Uber at 127000 That's also what it cost you to break into the top 10 today, 127000 contracts. Number nine, Ford. Ford back down in the, shall we say, uh, anemic range. I believe it's back in a five handle. Let's see out here really quickly. Yeah, 505, threatening to break five to the downside. Let's see if it did earlier today. No, 52 week low is five even. So it hit five and rebounded. We'll see if it can maintain that off another 60 cents or about 10.3% today. So Ford almost back. It was at about a dollar in the crisis, you remember, listeners. Almost back to those levels. And you could buy all the Ford you could possibly want for a dollar. All right, uh, number four, Ford, 132,000. Number eight, Disney. If you've seen the images of the shutdowns over at Disney World and Disneyland over the weekend, you know what's going on out there. 143,000 contracts for Disney. Number seven, American Airlines. Kind of an obvious one, a buck fifty on the tape. Number six, GE, two hundred and five thousand contracts. Number five, AMD, two hundred and seventeen thousand. Number four, once again, Microsoft has been kind of locked in this number four spot for a while, which is weird. It's not the name you would think of that would be lighting it up in a pandemic-driven environment, but yet Microsoft has locked that number four spot for a while, two hundred twenty-four thousand. Number three. Day that ends in Y, got to be Tesla somewhere in there, 256000 just a little bit north of a quarter million. Then we get to Bank of America, number two, 278000 number one with a bullet yet again. The old fruit company, 518000 contracts on the tape. Mr. Schwartz, before we move on to some, uh, let's just make it the rest of the show pretty uh, listener-driven. But before we move on to that... Unless you're up for it, if you want to do a trade alert inspired odd block, we we could certainly do that if you are so inclined. But before we go on, since you've been parsing the flow here now uh, for weeks and months, any other highlights, any other nuggets, any other records that really stand out for you you want to share with us, sir? Um, I mean, there's records all over the place. I, I think that people are 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 kind of spooked by this this move and by the you know, the virus. Uh, I agree with Mark that there, there is some incredible, uh, and Andrew, there's some incredible opportunity for people that didn't get too big, you know, that, that were, that were being very careful about their trade sizing and, and kind of sticking to a plan. Um, and that, you know, you can, you can pick up a lot of stocks for, you know, for 25 to, to 35% of what they cost three weeks ago. So, uh, I've put on, on, um, Twitter a couple times a run of just the biggest movers in the last three weeks. And, you know, obviously energy is, is, has moved into a, a, a kind of frightening end of things. And there, there is a lot of, there continues to be a lot of, you know, very dire, um, discussion about, uh, debt loads now that equity has repriced. And, uh, so I don't, I, I don't know if I agree with Mark that we could be, uh, kind of back up by the end of the year. Um, but I do think that if you're, if you're not kind of, you know, if your back's not against the wall and you have the, the kind of the, the wherewithal to look and think about the opportunities, uh, I mean, you know, volatility is, is basically at, you know, the, the highest level we've seen in, you know, more than a decade. And, uh, that's not going to last forever. So, you know, you can design trades around that. And, uh, you know, putting some money into stocks, you know, especially doing it through short puts when, you, you know, you know, you might get assigned, but you're OK with that. Uh, you know, it, it is the it is a, a very good chance, very good opportunity to do that. So, um, you know, there's you know, we are seeing, uh, you know, kind of um, people picking their spots. I mean, there, there have been plenty of, of, you know, what we call put bomber trades where somebody uh, basically picks a, a strike, you know, 15, 20 percent below spot in a, in a stock that they are basically comfortable taking a very large position in uh, and blowing out 25, 35,000 puts and picking up, you know, somewhere between a buck or two bucks. Uh, and you know, it doesn't mean the stock's going to bounce, but it does mean that somebody believes that, you know, in a fundamental, you know, kind of Warren Buffett type of uh, approach that they are OK with owning, you know, a, a, a you know, three, four, five percent of the of the company. So. Uh, you know, I, I think that like, like most market crises, you know, if you, if you can kind of step back a little bit, not get sucked into freak outs, uh, that there's all sorts of opportunity, but you, you really do have to kind of put some thought into how this is going to play out. Uh, you know, there's obviously the, the airlines and the cruise lines and the energy, uh, space, you know, have had in, insane, 
you know, I mean, 70, 80 percent moves. And uh, depending on what you think, uh, you know, the next six months or a year is going to look like, I do think things will calm down and that, you know, that we, we will come out of this. Uh, I just think that, you know, people are scared. And when people are scared, they're, 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 you know, they're shopping emotionally for toilet paper and they're trading emotionally when it comes to dumping everything they have without even thinking about it. Uh, and, th- and that's what we've seen. I think we're going to see we we are seeing a ton of, of questions. Let's let's maybe instead of going into our odd block, let's let's dispense with our usual format cuz there are a lot of folks out there who need to be talked off the ledge. You just calm down and just share their opinions on what they're seeing out there. So I think without further ado, let's do our our public duty and head on into a special Monday edition of the Mail Block. <laughs> It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block, the portion of the show where you guys take the reins, your questions, your comments, your insights. We actually like to turn the tables on you guys every now and then. Been kind of busy. Haven't done this in a while, but we are in somewhat unprecedented water. So we asked you heading into the weekend this week. No, coming in on Monday, coming into today, we are in effectively uncharted territory in the options market where this effectively, for the most part, again, I have to check on on Amex and whether they're still open. Maybe maybe Mr. Schwartz has that info for us as well as Picos. But if they are still open, we still are in a predominantly electronically traded options market for the first time ever. And so that that brings us to some interesting territory. Also, some interesting questions. Sibo. Closing their floor on Friday. No word on when it will reopen. CME taking that step earlier last week. Uh, no word from them either on when they plan to reopen. So we thought we'd ask you guys. You know, both CME, CBO, taking extraordinary steps of closing their respective trading floors. No dates given for when they're going to reopen, which raises the question, do you expect these trading floors will ever reopen? And so far, you guys are pretty optimistic. I'm, I'm somewhat impressed. Our audience sometimes skews towards the shall we say, dark side, the pessimistic side. But 56% of you saying, yes, both will reopen, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, then we gave you some other choices, like uh, will this only the CME reopen? Only 2.4% of you choosing that. Uh, 31% of you saying, no, open outcry is dead. So there are still some pessimists out there. And 10.7% of you saying, only the SIBO will reopen. I could foresee a scenario where that happens. CME has in the past expressed its shall we say, lack of interest in protracted floor trading. So if this is the opportunity they take to get out of it, it wouldn't surprise me as much as SIBO. SIBO still has obviously a vested interest in that. That's got a few hours left if you want to go play and make your voices heard out there. Speaking of making your voices heard, listeners, you guys have been uh, doing so in mass. Let's start with this guy. A lot of people have had similar questions. So let's get this guy on here first because he's kind of representative of a large a large mass of the audience. This, this particular flavor comes from Mike Wienick. hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He wants to know, if the markets are shut down due to the extraordinary circumstances and I have expiring in the money puts that I bought, what happens? Are the expiring options automatically exercised or, are, or, or do they just expire worthless? A little bit of a typo there. No problem. Stressful times, we get it. Or do they just expire worthless because the market was shut down? Well, some good news for you guys. A lot of people have been asking similar questions. What happens? Do my options just go away? Do they vanish into the ether? Can I do anything with them? Now, obviously, if the underlying is halted, you, what you can't, you're limited in how you could close those out. You can't just go hit a bid or lift an offer. But they are an option. They give you that option, right, to exercise them if you like. So if you are seeing a scenario where you think the markets are going to eventually reopen far south of your put strike, and it sounds like your puts are in the money, so that could be the case, then you can still exercise them regardless of what's going on with the underlying exchanges. So it could be worth it for you, even if you have puts in that scenario where they're far out of the money, it could be still worth it for you to exercise them if you think that's going to open below it. Also worth noting, you guys should, if you ever have any questions on these sorts of structural contract type issues, OCC is the place to go, Options Clearing Corp. In fact, they have a special circular about just this that they've been putting out there recently. A lot of people have this exact same question. That's what the voodoo at OCC has to happen, right? They will do a settlement value for that contract. How they determine that, that could be a little bit up in the air. You may have issues. We talked about settlement and VIX and other products having issues. So you may not like the settlement price they come up with, but they will give you a settlement price too uh, for those options. They have to settle out at something. Uh, Mr. Flowmaster, since you're our guest, I'll let you chime in here first. First off, if you have your own vote for our floor, will they open or not poll, have at it. 
And then B, what do you have to say for uh, Mr. Mike here who wants to who wants to know what happens if he has puts and the exchanges are pretty much all shut down, all halted, sir? Uh, well, it's a good question, and and it it, it does kind of scare me when you see people calling for shutting the markets. You know, because that's just like you know a, a multi-day circuit breaker. It lets people get freaked out and just do things that make no sense. Um, I do have a little bit of color on the trading floors because I've been in touch with SPX uh, crowd members uh, and and also the Philly. Uh, with SPX, I actually had I had somebody ask specifically. Uh, how much of that volume was already electronic, right? Because they've been on hybrid for a couple of years now. And it's about 50% of the flow has been electronic uh, for months. So, but, but there's a big, big difference on the size. So you know, the largest electronic trade in January was about 4,000 contracts. Uh, and the average electronic order size in SPX was about, uh, was about seven, which kind of surprised me. I guess people are actually trading one lots in SPX. Uh, the you know all of the big stuff I'm talking about orders you know fifteen thousand uh, you know and twenty thousand contracts and these you know these four ways right where they do a they do a diagonal tied to a combo which is kind of what SPX is used for those are those have all been open outcry uh, because they're a real pain in the butt to get into the complex order book uh, they they take a you know a, a voice negotiation between a broker and a couple of market makers. Uh, and then they print it. I mean, the, you know, SBX in a lot of ways works the same as it worked in the in the in the 1990s when I was down there as a as a clerk. Um, so I think I think that SBX will will return to the pit when it's safe to do so. Uh, I think that they I think Seabogel just kind of had to make a call, and they, you know, you see these regulations hitting cities where they you know they're they're limiting groups of people. I mean, SBX is about 150 guys, so and girls. Uh, and I think they wanted to stay ahead of that. Uh, the, the Amex decided not to close, uh, partly because you know there are there are people down there, but they're not all grouped in a big cluster like you know SPX or, or even the VIX pit. Uh, and so they're staying open, but they're not letting non-essential people show up. Uh, and I, Arc is the same way. Uh, I was a little bit surprised that Philex decided to close. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if that one, although it, it is a brand new trading floor, you know, they've only been open for a couple of years on that, uh, on that floor. Uh, but that one, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of transitioned to pure electronic because, you know, in a floor like that, there's not, really isn't that much of a difference. SPX and, and VIX are, are kind of their own animal. Uh, and I think they will, uh, I, I think those will stay open in terms of, um, what happens if there was a multi-day halt and, and, um, uh, you're right. OCC basically decides what the reference value is going to be. Uh, you got to be really, really careful in short options when there's a when there's a halt like that. You know, remember when when some of those Chinese ADRs were halting a couple of years ago, and they wouldn't trade for weeks, and people would have that options, and you know there there might be like a whisper in terms of where the stock was going to be. And so you could have puts that OCC was not going to expire because they were technically out of the money, but everybody knew when the stock opened up it was going to be near zero. So you would have to you know, be very proactive in saying, okay, I need to give exercise instructions uh, to my broker and figure out what the cutoffs are because different brokers have different timelines for that. So um, that's, you know, that, that's the, the deal on uh, options into, into halt situations. Uh, you know, and, and even even you know nowadays when we're we're seeing you know daily moves in the five to eight percent range, uh, you got to be careful on um, you know exercise instructions on, even on spy uh, because you know you have you have the futures that are moving and if the futures you know shoot higher after the close, but the closing price for spy put your calls out of the money. Uh, in some cases, people people can, the institutions can assign their options until about five thirty at night. Okay, retail usually can't, so uh, that can uh, that can create all sorts of really hairy dynamics if you're short uh, or even long a call spread, and you assume that both legs are going to go out worthless, and then it turns out one leg gets assigned or one leg should have been assigned. Uh, it can that that's when everything kind of falls apart, and you get situations where. Um, there was something on uh, on Reddit a couple of years ago where somebody somebody was short a put spread 
uh, and made about three times what the interval was between strikes <laughs> because they got assigned and the market shot higher. Uh, but it could work the other way around too. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a time that, you know, people that are new at this need to keep their trades tiny and don't do anything that you don't fully understand. Uh, because you know, yeah. things, are, things are weirder now than, than they usually are. You know, one of the things to be aware of is you're going to make more, if you're good at this, you're going to make more per trade. And so you don't need to trade as big, you know, um, in my little, um, my little, my sharp bet service, they were like, why are you only trading one lots? And the answer is because, uh, normally I'd have to trade five of them to try and make a couple hundred bucks. Now I can trade a one lot and make a couple hundred bucks. Uh, and it's, so you can risk less and theoretically make the same because, um, things are moving around so much. There's, there's that much kind of edge in, in, in everything we trade. And so if you still think you're going to go out and sling a bunch of size, um, that's the quickest way to, to put yourself out of business today. Now is the time where you know, like Mike said, you're trading 1% of your portfolio to try and make 1% a day. Um, whereas in the past, you got to trade 80% of your portfolio to make 1% a day. That's the, that's the beauty of a market like this for someone who's actually trading. And the beauty of our live chat is it allows you to jump to the top of the line if you have a question. We got a, quite a few questions, you might imagine. But we like to make sure you live folks uh, get bumped in there as well, like uh, Tony Weber. Taking advantage of that. I think he came in last week, too, so. He's been uh, taking advantage of that live queue. If you want to get answered quickly, that's the place to go, listeners. He was asking, uh, let's see, any advice for handling large bid-ass spreads? Yeah, we're seeing a few of those right now. Uh, is it better to sell options with the hope of the options expiring worthless? Are resting orders a good idea? So kind of like three questions here in one. Uncle Mike, you didn't get a chance to do a strategy block today. So let's have you uh, take a swing at any one of these three questions here uh, from Tony, starting off with uh, any advice for him, sir, on handling large bid-ass spreads in these types of crazy environments, sir? Yeah, well, okay. So in terms of large bid-ass spreads, limit order, limit order, limit order. Um, I think that uh, I typically advise limit orders uh, most of the time anyway. Uh, the only time I will ever do a market order is if I really need to get out of something or uh, and even then I'm very cautious on it. I'll do kind of my own little, I'll put in a limit order, maybe, uh, right at the offer or right at the bid. If I really need to get out of something. So, I mean, I honestly can't even tell you the last time I did a, a market order to tell you the truth. Um, but with that, unless it's like maybe on a contingency or, um, there's really not a lot of time for market orders in especially in markets like this. Uh, in terms of selling premium, should you just let things expire worthless uh, or try and get out? I think that if you have your limit order in, let it sit there. But if you're looking to manage risk, I don't think you need to be trading in a levered uh, portfolio right now unless um, – you're in something extremely liquid. And even SPY is having wider bid ask spreads right now. So uh, to answer the question about wide bid ask spreads, uh, limit orders, uh, should you let something expire worthless? Well, if you're fine taking delivery, yes. If not, then no, you really, you're going to need to pay the price with the wider bid ask spread uh, with what you're doing. I think, Mike, and to that point, today is a giant lesson on why it's always worth it to close stuff for a cabinet. Uh, a cabinet is a really inexpensive uh, price for an option, usually less than a nickel. Um, it, you know, one, believe it or not, you're going to make more money closing your options for less than 10 cents and selling the next one the next month out than you will letting everything expire worthless. And you are short. And, and th let me tell you about the people that didn't close their nickel options and penny options that were trading weeklies that are now uh, out of business when, um, you know, anybody out there preaching, anybody who's not closing out penny options, nickel options, anything at cabinet, they're not worth the snot that goes on a rack. So you, you are, are doing yourself a massive disservice if you're not closing out things for a cabinet. So uh, you've, got to, they are, these are the example of why 
you close things for less time. And, and I'll say this one more time. If you are a, a consistent option roller and you, and when your option that you sold gets worth less than a dime and you cover it and then go and sell something else, you actually make more money than if you let it expire worthless and then sell the next and then sell. Um, and it, and it has to do with the nature of how extra inexpensive options decay. So don't be a dummy. Close your spreads when they make a bunch of money. Honey. Honey. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Well said. Let's see how many others we could squeeze on, in on here. I like this handle. The Comical Canadian. He was listening on YouTube. By the way, a lot of you, more and more of you listening on YouTube. Again, I've said before, not our intended way for people to consume this content. It kind of goes out automatically via our distribution platforms. And YouTube is one of the ones on there so if you like it there have at it you know enjoy it we're not going to dissuade you from it and more of you seem to be enjoying it that way so enjoy it hey have at it have fun but this great handle the comical canadian <laughs> he says uh he liked option block uh 883 aka the one we called 1987 redux he said that was awesome content it was really entertaining well right back at you comical canadian and everyone else who's enjoying it out there on the tubes Hope you keep enjoying it. Scott Summer is always chiming in. Uh, he chimed in. He's asking a lot about whether uh, whether other floors are going to close down like NASDAQ. Uh, he chimed in with a release saying NASDAQ to continue operating electronic markets and to shut the Philly options floor trading on March 17th, what we were just talking about. He says praying this gets better. Yeah, I think we're all with you there. Uh, but, yeah, a little bit surprising that we are seeing uh, Philly, I guess. I guess no one was up for doing some dip plays today, so they decided to shut the the Philly floor. And it is a new floor, but it is still a it's a smaller venue, but it is still a concentrated environment. So I could see why they would probably probably uh, want to do uh, that. Let's see, let's see if squeezing a few more here. This goes back to uh, last episode, Mister Uncle Mike, when you were chiming. You had your Johnny Cash analogy. <laughs> a regular guy chimed in saying uh, he, he, he had to have his own dot Johnny Cash with the markets. He said, we're down, 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 that ring of fire, that ring of fire. Yeah, I, I think we're all with you there, Mr. Regular Guy. I like, the hand, I like your, your icon, by the way, Ron, Ron Burgundy. That's, that's a nice one. Um, Jay Sung Min chiming in saying, sell the rip seems like the theme nowadays until uncertainty is gone. Yeah. Uh, you're not seeing a lot of those hashtag BTFD <laughs> that used to be all the rage out there on places like stock twits and stuff. And it was hard to argue with them. It did work for quite a long time. This bull market raged on for nigh on 11 years. Of course, there were some there were some impediments along the way. But for the most part, BTFD, kind of, as much as I'm not a fan of it, did kind of work until it didn't. Remember, we had to have those plans in place for when it doesn't. And right now is certainly... One of those times. So I think I think Jay Sung Min were all with you there. Our buddy Mr. Ulaveri, Bill Ulaveri has been on crypto with me a number number of times. He's chiming down that all the exchanges closing the floor. He says he thinks it's a really bad idea closing the SIBO floor. He's an old school SIBO market maker, so some stake in that. This is a common question we're getting a lot from a lot of folks. Nicholas Nick Ticks, easy for me to say. He wants to know why should I bother with options when I can just get short. With SDS, SDS is of course one of those levered ratio ETF type uh, products out there. We talked about these before. I've often only have jokingly referred to them as Franken products because they're guess what? I, or also poor man's options because they're using options to deliver those levered returns. How do you think they're getting those listings? So if you're a little leery of options and you're using SDS instead, guess what? You're trading options at the end of the day. I don't know, Mister Mister Schwartz, as our guest, sir. Uh, what do you have to say for folks like Nick Ticks who chime in and say, why, why the heck should I bother with options when I could just get short using the poor man's option, a.k.a. SDS, and, and it's ilk, sir? Well, that's same as looking at some of these stocks that are you know now a buck where we still see some calls trading. And in fact, in the some of the chaos of last week, uh, I did a scan on call trades where the option price was above the stock price and put trades where the option price was above parity. And there were plenty uh, people, I think, in that case, getting liquidated and the brokers doing at all what they're paying. Um, I, I mean, there are there are other ways to get exposure, uh, you know, but you don't get the convexity that you get from options. So, uh, you know, and, and the other thing is, you know, you've seen a lot of headlines over the last couple of weeks about some some real dislocations between the ETFs and components. So. You know, the supply and demand, uh, you know, when you're one step removed can can get a little bit uh, a little bit crazy. And, uh, you know, so things that even even if you're right, sometimes you can get yourself you know, in a corner 
where you know you're not able to make the money even though what you expected to happen happened. So uh, you know I think that people need to need to do their you know, do their research, know what they're getting into, uh, and you know in in most cases you know options give you more flexibility than anything else, uh, but you have to be careful, right? And you know if you if you dip your dip your toes into something that's very thin, especially you know in these kind of market conditions, uh, you you got to be careful. You don't get just just ripped off. You know, Mark, you were talking about some of these inverted spreads. Uh, I've seen I've <laughs> I've seen some of the other way around where somebody long a spread that should be worth about a dime uh, accidentally sends it in as a market order to exit. Okay, expecting to get you know maybe eight cent credit, maybe seven cent credit. And they get a three cent debit. So they're the other side of your of your inverted spread, uh, you know. And it's not that's not supposed to be possible, right? You, you, you know, that kind of a trader gets furious because obviously they just got ripped off. But in these kind of market conditions, you know, it's it's, it's you got to beware of, uh, you know, it is a it is a free market, right? So uh, you know, value doesn't have the same meaning when uh, people are, you know, in in a lot of cases in in basically a panic mode. Uh, so you have to know what you're doing is, is what I'm saying. I think you just hit on another cool, hot scan product there for Trade Alert, the, the premium out of whack scan. I like that. I mean, you have to come up with a, a sexier handle for it, I think, than that. But that could, I think that could be very popular in times like this. Unfortunately, speaking of time, that music means we pretty much come to the end of our allotted time on this journey, listeners. So we'll kind of do a quick combo around the block as well as What's cooking with everyone type scan. Of course, if you want more in your ear holes and who can blame you on a day like today, don't worry. If you're listening after the fact on the on-demand devices of choice, hit next. We'll have more content hitting there for you. If you're listening live, stay tuned. We'll pump some fun stuff in the live chat. We'll be back in exactly an hour to talk crypto. Got some great guests over there from the options world joining me on crypto there as well. So stay tuned for that. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Let's start with our guest, the Flowmaster. He's a busy man these days. Mr. Flowmaster, what are you watching for the rest of the week? And also, if you have any interesting nuggets, any interesting new developments, any interesting maybe premium out of wax scans you want to share with us in the trade alert, what's trading realm? Now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. Well, the uh, one thing that we're really watching is kind of the level of, of panic because it, it comes and it goes. And, you know, you saw that fear turn into greed, uh, you know, in about two minutes on Friday. Uh, and, you know, so... We're watching for when things get, you know, really, really dire, and everybody is sure that we're going to go down another ten percent. Uh, you know, that's probably the time we actually flip around. Uh, but it's it's gnarly out there. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. The volume's off the charts. The, the bid offer is is very challenging. Uh, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, the market's still working. You, you know, you're still seeing uh, a lot of intelligent trades go up. Uh, but you're also seeing a lot of stupid things happen. So, uh, you know, that gives us plenty to talk about, and, and that's interesting. Uh, you know, and, and you also got to realize, you know, the entire industry now is basically working, you know, you know, a third remotely, a third in their backup center, and a third from home. So uh, I've talked to a couple of traders that are dealing with that, and, um, you know, and, and it'll be really interesting to see how that SPX uh, volume holds up. And if we if we do start to see the trade size shrinking, or if we hear anybody having real trouble, because uh, I, I do think that that's uh, something to watch. Uh, in terms of our own system, uh, besides basically just adding memory and more processors to deal with this incredible amount of activity, uh, we rolled out some enhancements to our earnings gap functionality. So you can actually now look at any stock and not only see the upcoming earnings implied move, uh, but you can see how it's done over the last eight quarters and, and get a quick read on Okay, I can see Tesla's, you know, underperformed the the gap over you know the last three, and before that it was outperforming. So, uh, just helps pull all the all that information into one place for people. So, and you know, we're we're just we're hustling to keep up with with everything that's going on and, and help people understand it as we always do. There you go, kick the tires and light the fires for yourselves, listeners. Trade alert for the pro meaty professional grade version or what's trading. Uh, for the more uh, retail-friendly, just type them both into your browser of choice. Go to whatstrading.trade-alert.com. That'll take you there as well. But if you ever wanted to parse some options flow and have an understanding of what the heck's going up out there, I think now might be the time. 
So uh, trade alert slash rush trading. Pretty much the only game in town for that. Head on over there uh, before Sibo gobbles them up too. And then there's no independent analytics companies out there left. <laughs> What's trading and tradealert.com. Uncle Mike, same question for you, sir. Uh, what are you watching? And also, if folks want to get a hold of you in these troubled times, and I have to imagine more than one or two of them do, uh, where should they go? What should they do? stcharleswealth.com contact me in terms of the next number that I'm looking at wanting to see if we can break the December 2018 lows uh, to see where we're at with that and uh, see if we can stay below them if we go there and uh, just checking that out and then uh, this is a news driven market so that's what I'm watching this is the news oh is there some news now oh okay I guess there's some news to watch stcharleswealth.com is the place to go when you're not busy surfing the news sites click on the fox maybe it'll do something someday but also it'll get you in touch with the unclest of Mike's, as I like to call him around here. And last but not least, from a Costco near you, Mr. Mister Meatball, sir, what are you watching? And also, folks want to check out the recording of your great volatility event from last week or just join your ball trading club. Where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, you know, I'm. Uh, if you're not a member of our email list, go to Optica.com, register for an email. We're going to be doing a flash live event tomorrow. Uh, where I'm going to do some trading uh, live in person. So, uh, But you need to be able to get the email from me so that you know to uh, where when I'm going to speak. I can tell you that uh, the one I did last Thursday, my idea that I came up with was, uh, hey, you know what would be good is paying like a buck thirty for the 60, 70, 80 call butterfly. Uh, that, that's worked out pretty well. That's... Uh, you know, that's, that's only up a hundred percent plus, you know, not, that's so terrible. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm i I'm a happy camper. Uh, make sure you, uh, you come in and, and check us out. Cause like I said, this is going to be your, uh, your real chance at, at, um, watching me, uh, kind of try and navigate these markets. There you go. If you want to watch him for yourself, maybe get, get access to some of those cool trades and a lot more option pits. Dot com is the place to go. Join their cool ball trading club. Get the secret handshake, the key to the secret clubhouse, and, and fun trades like that. Optionpit.com. So you got Trade Alert, you got Option Pit, St. Charles Wealth, a lot of fun places to go and do some stuff while the markets are melting down around your ears. And on behalf of Mr. Schwartz, the AKA the Flowmaster, and Uncle Mike, and the Meatball, and indeed myself, I thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing. If you're listening live, stay tuned. If you're listening after the fact, hit next. We'll be back pretty soon in about exactly a little less than an hour now, talking all things lighting up the vol space on the crypto side. Everyone's looking for this, you know, this digital gold, this inversely correlated asset. So these days, when it all hits the fan, correlation goes to one. We'll break all that down, bring some great options perspectives and volatility and derivatives perspectives onto that show as well. So stay tuned for that. Otherwise, we'll see you back here later this week for more of our great shows, OPR, all the other stuff hitting the network this week. And then back again on Thursday for more of the Option Block. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>